There's no other way to build LP versus VK than the old versus the new. Omega Zero, Trunks, and X Hope, the team for LP. Xiaoming, um, XHX, Diana, and Lion, the team for VK. All newer players. Even our world champion is one of the newer players to our eyes. But Omega Zero has been around a long time at one point. Pretty much the savior of the Chinese scene. Didn't quite get it done at the Worlds, but still managed to represent them in multiple big championship events. And we've seen a resurgence from X Hope and Trunks. See how Omega Zero is coping as well. Uh, the lineups, both Warriors have been banned, which amuses me slightly because Tian Ming has brought the Dragon version of Druid, something that most people have not been bringing, and it does better against Warrior than than the regular version so that's interesting to me also um, has the plot twist warlock and of course the ever present demon hunter omega zero the same lineup take out the druid put in the rogue and i think that looks a little bit more solid just because the rogue versus the demon hunter matchup is a little better than the well it's a lot better than the druid versus demon hunter matchup if you're looking at the simple way to work it out but that never quite transpires and we are rapidly into this game, so let's have a look how it is going. Tianming are ready to start dropping minions. Possibly even go crazy with a Mount Seller next turn, especially if he picks up something to play with his coin. Uh, Omega Zero, though, holds the Doomsayer for this moment and buys himself an extra turn. Tianming... Sensibly dropping the Emerald, Emerald Explorer. It's not going to have much time to be played in the next few turns. So might as well work out right now what he wants to do with it. It's not an aggressive option. It's just a way of getting extra cards. And the potential to pick up some extra one drops is taken. I think that was the right call. Something to go with maybe a second Mount Seller should it be needed. Omega Zero. Already close to completing the quest, and with this plot twist, we'll pretty much guarantee that he's going to complete it over the course of the game. Although, games against druids who mount seller you on turn 5 or 6 don't always last very long. Does have the twisting nether, so if he can limp along to his 8 mana turn, Omega Zero might have a chance of getting out of this. But here comes the Mount Seller turn. You want to do it as quickly as possible so you don't walk into Twisting Nether. Um, although the Warlock has a lot of removal, it just can't remove this amount of stuff that we're about to see here. And will inevitably take damage as it tries to clear the board over two turns. Currently no Moag in hand either for Omega Zero, which is a big deal because it makes it much harder to remove the Mount Cellar. Also you'll notice that Hellfire, that is um, a build that is much more popular in China than it is in our Grandmasters, so you keep an eye on how that performs. Always interesting how the different regions have their own take on things. And I do think that the Hellfire might be actually quite reasonable. A deck that heals back up, that needs early damage, why not? Compare it to the Netherwing, obviously you don't get a minion on the board, but you can do it a turn earlier, deal with, say, Demon Hunter much more respectably, and it's unconditional, you take three damage and clear a board, again, especially against Demon Hunter, uh, which is starting to play more three health minions in recent times. Some of that due to the nerfs that hadn't yet happened, in this tournament, but you know, Shadow Weaver's one heck of a good card. And now the crux of the battle this time around. Shaming's job is to start to get this damage into the face. We see a requirement to get rid of the 9 9 here. Is the dragon pickup from a few turns ago coming home to show off its value? And that's the thing that the top players have over your common and garden players. 
is they just see this little bit further ahead and picture how it's going to unfold. The Spellkin was a reasonably obvious choice, like to an experienced eye. But it's not the power card. Because the power card doesn't matter. Look at his hand, he's going to have power cards. What he needs is this exact situation right now. Some nice little one mana things to tidy up a board. And to put his opponent under maximum pressure. And this, let's not mess around here, is maximum pressure. So, super lethal setup here. I can't see any way to clear this up that makes any sense. Netherwing does a lot of damage. Moog Hellfire does a lot of damage as well, but not enough. He's got, yeah, he's got the Mortal Coin as well, so he can actually clear the board. And he only takes three, it doesn't double the damage to his face. We'll take some more from the Porcupine, go down to six. Survives, and there's no threat on board. Maybe I spoke a little bit quickly when I said there's no way to do that efficiently. And that's the quest completed, I believe. And so now Omega Zero will have chance after chance to get zero mana help. Healing up's help. Put another 9 9 in the way here. Eh, it's an 8 8, but you know, a big thing then for the pedants amongst you. And just drop the, the taunt as well. We may not see him drop everything here because he wants to Twisting Nether next turn. So he might want to drop his taunt after Nethering to have some element of board presence. Chumming, cycling, but incredibly just running out of stuff slightly. And yeah, the Hellfire surprised me. I, I could see that the board would clear, but I didn't think really clearly about how well Omega Zero would be placed after that. Not out of the woods yet, though. I'm thinking in terms of the Twisting Nether, but... There's portals galore in the deck. So this one could go a long, long way yet. Which I mean, we'll have a turn where he gets three or four dragons as well. Time will tell whether that comes before or after the Twisting Nether. That's the game we're currently invested in. Who will win the battle of the Twisting Nether? Will Omega Zero get to clear up a large amount of Tianming's board? Or will Tianming just mow him down so he has to clear up two or three minions? Which will leave Omega Zero open to the future overflow that's bound to come at some point and draw a million dragons. He's concentrating on getting those dragons. I'll be tempted to play the bright wing here before cycling. This makes sense. Shipping away, but now the clock is on. Big decision for Omega Zero. What he wants to do is get Alex Straza down. Doesn't set up lethal just yet anyway. But everything but. The Druid basically doesn't heal, so playing Alex Straza and maybe just zero mana taunt would put all sorts of pressure on Jamming ready for next turn. Whilst probably not dying in the process. The Druid having no swipes and cards like that these days means you're generally okay. 
Let me just check the list for um, Savage Roars here. Yeah, they don't exist in this version of the deck. That's something you give up for the more consistent pressure, which means the double Bog Beam, double Savage Roar, for instance, isn't something to worry about. Well, this is horrible for Tianming. He's going to have to double Bog Beam down the 4 6 and then Iron Bark up his minions so he doesn't get hit by the Alex. That seems just grim. Maybe he gets a Fungal and try and hit something with that. The portals aren't minions, they are spells, so they do not get discarded, they resolve properly. The portals that he's probably wondering where they are because he hasn't hardly seen them. Not the best, but he'll take it for now. Interesting to see if he plays this claw here. Just for the two armour in case he's in trouble. But 21's a fairly safe number. Well, it's not a safe number, but it's not a break point. The break point's being 18, um, 24 which is factors of 9s and 6s basically, multiples of 9s and 6s which is what the Maligos does with the spells that Warlock has because it's always for us sitting here going well Maligos is 9 and there's only one zero amount of soul fire but Jamming will be terrified at this point so I don't know who won the battle of the nether, assuming the nether goes now because after the nether comes the mount cellar. Like, it feels like Omega Zero won that battle. He's going to get a massive amount of value from it. But the reload for Tian Ming kind of makes it a wash, I think. Any sort of half decent rolls will actually put Tian Ming in front. I think we've seen six portals. We might have seen all seven. I'm not going to commit to that. I do try and keep track, but obviously, you know, things go a bit wonky sometimes. All right, Mount Seller turn. You've seen the nether. Your opponent's going to kill you soon. Go, 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 go. Uh, just talking about those breakpoints, looking at Nort Manor Blood Mage as well. That, that does skew some equations a bit. Chumming. Just not wanting to get anything wrong here. This is basically his last effort. Got some removal in hand. So, right, how does this work out? Double Netherwind clears. Leaves him on one, he dies. So that's not an option. Alex not active on eight cards that's pretty unfortunate for how this deck works out so nether breaths are available to kill things and heal if he's going to go for that we may well see the blood mage and even a tap to try and get a moag to get the maximum healing out and in fact with only eight cards left yeah omega zero is just having a redo on this that's better already that's better already. So although he can kill everything, I'll be wondering, interesting to see if he uses a nether breath anyway to gain some health. I don't think he will because Keladan's so amazing here, but that's fine. He gets the full health there. Now he'll be comfortable. Blows everything up with Keladan, which was over 50-50 if you look at it. And jumping, I think that's the last portal. Needs something spectacular. I don't even know what it would be. Well, that's spectacular. That's lethal in one lovely looking card. With the Twin Tyrant. 27 health, minus 4 from the attack. He's 23. Wait. Wait. 
don't like that attack. But I assume he's mathed it so he can do it next turn. The reason I don't like it is because it now leaves him exposed to just dying. 20. I guess there's no difference between 20 and 24, so that's fine. No substantial difference. There's always a difference, of course. So yeah, he was able to do that. And because there are now does have multiple routes to do this. And with Zephyrus active, you would think that he's just got to get through this one turn and then he's safe. And yeah, here's the the healing for so much damage. All the way back up to full health. And Chiaming is not going to win this and Omega Zero is going to win it forgetting break points. He's just going to win it with regular means. Goes under 15 with the Alex to the face but Zephyrus is active. Obviously Chiaming doesn't know if it's in hand or not so he pretty much has to push there. I wonder why Omega Zero is taking his time. It's just so he's working out whether to tap or not. He only has three cards of his own left. Um, so checking his mana and also checking if anything makes sense and what he wants. But this is what he wanted. It forces the concede. And despite an amazing start for Tian Ming, Omega Zero, mainly with the Hellfire, because the damage was doubled, which wouldn't have been doubled on the Nether Wings, takes down the first game. And... He only just did it, and remember, he played a Doomsayer going into the 7 mana turn to buy one extra turn. And on such small things, games can win and lose, or be won and lost. So, in Last Hero, when your opponent queues up a mirror at 1-0 down, you know you're in a good spot. If that's the best they've got available, is a mirror, then in general, you're looking good. And this is a weird mirror match. You would think it's all about building up the combo and trying to combo your opponent to death before they combo you to death. But actually, it's pretty much about tempo. And I'll be interested to see just how far they take that tempo fight. Will we... I mean, the big deal is the Abyssal Summoners. You play that, you get a big thing on the board. You hit your opponent with it and play around their Dark Skies a bit. Obviously, one way to get tempo is to complete your quest and get a lot of zero mana cards. But I am curious, for things like this Swamp Ooze, uh, things like the Netherwing, will we just see them thrown out onto the board in an attempt to just get any sort of tempo? How all in on the tempo will they go? How many times do I say the word tempo in five minutes? Keep watching to find out. Remember to hit the subscribe button if you want to see when more of these videos are released. This is only season one as well. I'm assuming that season two will inevitably follow season one. It's kind of how numbers work. All right, Xiaoming, the first one to get the plot twist off, but you can see Omega Zero is not going to be far behind. And although getting there first is a big advantage, it's kind of an incremental big advantage. And if your opponent's only one turn behind you, you don't get to increment on them very hard. Also interesting to see here what hand size they decide to hang around at. So this has kept Xiaoming at 8, which is the number I feel is good. It allows you to always have space to hero power. And your natural draw takes you to 10 without being forced to have to play two things. Just means you can play one thing and, and keep your hand at nine if forced. So weirdly, eight is often the hand size the players will aim for in this mirror match. Lots of little factors and it's a mirror that I feel is still being explored even now. And this is not a new deck anymore. Also get to see 
players sometimes will waste a card. I think we're going to see it here with this Mortal Coil. Just to get it out of their hands, keep their hand size sensible. They're not scared to dump the slightly inefficient cards. That's a CMS. I should take a look at this rest of this list. There have been very little variance on a theme in the Warlock decks apart from where the Cartoon Defender is played. Which I'd looked at already and it's not in either deck. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be much else weird in here. Trying to work out what's gone, but that's hard. Oh, he's only got one questing in here. So just that first CM, that seems to be the main switch. And one soul fire, which switches in for the Swampoos. Decision time for Omega Zero. He's able to just mess around and complete the quest next turn with his natural draw if he taps here or he can just make a monstrous oh he hasn't got the abyssal six mana and purple card i just assume it's abyssal summoner it is not you can play netherwing and mortal coil that advances him towards quest completion gets his hand empty actually achieves something small along the way that's a position that seems reasonable to me. If you're going to waste your cards, you might as well waste them in a manner that do something. And this does generate the tempo. It's not the massive 9-9 I was hoping for, but you presumably can only play with the cards in your hand, which is a shame. At least for now. Maybe in years to come we'll be able to play with cards straight from our deck. Probably be a priest thing. Just have all 30 cards available to you at once. Assuming. Is he considering playing Zephyrus? That's. a concession. No, that's, that's much more sensible to me. And Omega Zero completes the quest. Now it's time to start getting zero mana cards. You want the maximum reduction. Maligos is the jackpot, but. Really, just anything big reduced to zero is fantastic. Might not be able to do it this turn, but he'll want to tap every single turn. The zero mana cards are the key to happiness in this deck. You're looking to throw the Hellfire, but... Is he then going to just rain for zero? Interesting. Maybe he just plays. I don't know what he plays here. Yeah, rain for zero. He does one damage, but it does zero relevant damage. Omega Zero won't want to be on 16 for long either. He'll want to get above 18. And you can win games. I, I talk about breakpoints a lot and it seems like they often don't matter. And they often don't matter. But the difference between 18 and 19 health in this matchup is huge. We will throw the Moag out there as well. It's going into the Twisting Nether turn, so probably not. There is the Twisting Nether. Twisting Nether best played, as I said in the previous game, where you have a big zero mana thing. That's big enough. So you Twisting Nether, you clear the board, and then you play your big thing to get the board on your side. And look at zero. Not quite at lethal yet. Would Maligos be lethal for zero? He could nether face for 9, he could soul 5 for 9, that's 18. Yeah, 0 mana Maligos would just be lethal here. So he wants to play the Alexstrasza, but it's an ongoing problem with this deck. That if you play Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, you don't get to hero power and get yourself a 0 mana card at the same time. 
It's actually a surprisingly big deal. That being said, if you play an Alexstrasza and you play two massive dragons alongside and your opponent has to do nothing that turn, you've also done pretty well. But my preference would be to keep getting the zero mana cards. You can play the Broodmother, although that is the second one. Right, he's going for it. He's getting cards out of his hand. Oh! So Nuzdome with Plot Twist was a bit buggy when this was played. It is illegal to put it in your deck, but if you've got it there, just don't abuse it. So if you Plot Twist here, which he hasn't got in his hand, thankfully, the rope just sometimes goes for the entirety of your opponent's turn and they can't do anything while the animation's resolved. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that. Chaming. What if he's going to coin out the hero power? If he's saving it for Malagos, which is a big deal. He's so close to lethal, right? Like Malagos. Soulfire Rain is 15. And on top of the zero mana Netherwing, that's lethal next turn. Was it lethal this turn? No, he was one mana short. That's how close he's getting, though. And yeah, he does nothing. No Omega Zero. Does gain four health. Is that still lethal on the other side? It's not right. It's 18. Yep, nine plus three plus six. It's 18 when I went to school. Is there any more hiding in there? And that's a big deal because Jamming missed his turn to set this up, but Omega Zero has hurt himself with his own Netherwing and now he's gonna die. And he knows that Jamming has the coin and that Jamming chose not to draw a card last turn. Gotta be so careful you're ordering here. So Maybe I mean it's it's not I'm not saying he played badly, but it, there are worlds where some players might have caught that he didn't need to injure himself for three. Is eighteen a number that's obviously to avoid? Yes, it is. I've said it all game. Maybe he felt that he was going to be overkilled if Malagos was zero, but I do feel that could have been avoided. Whether it would have changed the result, I do not know. But 18, key number, not played around. And it's one game apiece. And now we get into the Warlock versus the Rogue. Every single one of these matchups is contentious and nobody knows what is favoured. And this one is no different. This is the Stealth Rogue, as you can see there, by the Sky Vatier in hand. And what this does better, I want to say, in this particular matchup than Secret Rogue is it keeps spamming boards, keeps drawing cards better. So the Secret Rogue is more about hanging around, you know, using your blackjack stunners, setting up some annoying secrets. And Warlock doesn't really care. Uh, but the Stealth Rogue, there's not a huge difference, don't get me wrong here, but in terms of accentuating the differences, the Stealth Rogue keeps drawing cards, keeps the pressure on. If the Warlock kills the things, more things will sprout up in their place. But on the other side of it, they are very squishy and the, the Netherwing will just get rid of them. This rogue can't deal so well with a 9-9 a nine -nine Abyssal token and so on. So there's pros and cons to each, but the key for all of these is making sure to keep hitting the Warlock. They have to hurt themselves, they have to tap, they have to advance their game plan that way. So really, the rogue's only needing to do 20 damage, not the regular 30. Until this happens, and all the healing kicks in, and you start all over again. But the key is to keep starting all over again. Keep drawing those cards. And no healing has happened as of yet this turn. It'll be there in the future, but... This is a license for... 
Omega-Zero to get some damage in. We'll be looking to... Try and get over 10 health on the board. Which he has achieved. That means that Dark Skies just becomes all the more irritating. Needs backup from Mortal Coils or whatever. And he's looking with that in mind that coining out a Titanic Lackey, I would think, to really make that difficult, can also protect against Nether Wings that way by putting one of the minions over three health. Also has a Shadow Step option, but I don't think you want to be doing that. You want to save that for something giant later on. I like this a lot. This is just playing around your opponent 101. This is important damage. Look how low Chiang Ming is because of it. So he has all the buffs, so... Isn't going to die or anything next turn. But... It's very unpleasant right now. Gonna go for the plot twist, try and get some health. Also completes the quest. Seeing how quickly things change once that quest is completed. Interesting. Let's see if he does decide to tap here. He does. And I think you play this. Obviously, you're giving up a lot of value. Obviously, an 8 8 is going to suffer on this board. But also, obviously, you might not be alive in two or three turns' time to take advantage of your wonderful Dragon Queen. I'd like it to have served as a distraction. Twilight Drake. Does Twilight Drake get him? Just more stats. Trying to work out what would ruin that plan. It's only Keladan, which Xiaoming would have to draw into. We've seen that happen in other matches, but this is just a lot of incredibly irritating damage to deal with. I believe there's no Hellfire in this version of the deck. There is not, so the same trickery that we saw save Omega Zero is not available here for Tian Ming. He's got to do it a different way. This will do it. Can I get a full clear? I can get a lot of health back and clear a lot of stuff. This is where I get to find out if keeping the Dragon Queen was right or wrong, because the game's going to go much longer now. You really do have to fly by the seat of your pants to play this Warlock deck and not be scared of dying. It means that sometimes you will die and look stupid in the process, but it's just an occupational hazard of playing the deck. Note that how to play against the deck is exactly what Omega Zero is doing here. Make board after board and hit your opponent in the face a lot. Something else worth bearing in mind here, as he does use one of the Shadow Steps, is that next turn he'll be able to Galakrond, so hopefully he'll have things on board from his perspective to go into that Galakrond turn. And then the turn afterwards he has double Kronks available. Or at least Kronks Shadow Step and then Kronks again the turn after that, to be precise. And Kronks just eats health totals up for every meal of the day. One more turn and Xiao Ming gets to his twisting nether. And again, going back to that first game, Omega Zero managed to slow things down against the Druid with his Doomsayer. And Xiao Ming hasn't had that slowdown. That could be the difference between getting to twisting nether or not. Well, he can clear now. 
the Moag and the Dark Skies. Going to use a couple of cards to do it instead, that's also fine, obviously. Doesn't quite get rid of everything, but this is fine. Deciding not to rain to get rid of the other half. It's very brave. Worked for him last game, but I feel that last game Omega Zero got un well. He walked into one, I think. I think Chiaming doing nothing could have actually turned out badly for him that last game. Very interesting to see other analysis of that that game. Omega Zero, though, the play that I was talking about last turn, he doesn't really want to have to do this, but. It's important in setting up some sustained value. And also, obviously, the bouncy cronks. Flick will be handy. Sage will be handy. Now to see whether he values his tempo over card draw. He does indeed. Sometimes when you're playing against this Warlock deck, you just want to scream like, Why won't you just stop healing? Every time you think you've got them, they just wriggle out of it. It's always so close. The other thing is, Omega Zero hasn't rolled any damage. He's rolled all weird lackeys. No rush. No Cobalt. Uh, I'm not saying that's even bad because the Titanics have helped him keep boards alive. It's just weird. Big board available here though. Flick on the Netherwing's a decent thing to happen. You can save the Abyssal, but it doesn't get rid of the second Summoner. It only gets rid of the token. Because there are no tokens in your deck. That's kind of the rules of the game. Two on Moag is actually really aggravating here. What he wants to do is flick away the 5 5, uh, drop Kronks, and bounce it back to his hand. But that just doesn't add up to the right sort of situation. Yeah, I'm usually not for taking the Malagos here, but it feels like he might need a push to get him over the line. And that could definitely be that push. Indecisive turn though, does end up roping it out, but looks like he got the the sensible things largely done there. nothing actually stupid happened and that's a professional thing as well if sometimes you whoever you are you have a turn where you look at the board and the board looks at you and you look at each other and you haven't got a clue what to do about it and in those situations instead of just blankly staring at the wall work out the key things and um, one of the key things there omega zero had to do was kill the five five another was to get the sage on the board and whatever else happened you know Whatever else happened, happened, almost. So no no foul there. Well, Maligos backstab looks really tasty. It's not the only solution, though. Flick. And this Kronks that I want to get down. Looks like he's saving the Kronks for 10 points of burst to me by now, though. So maybe he flicks away the CMAT here and just plays Malagos. Oh, that doesn't get him anywhere. So maybe he's going to have to flick and shield and get that. He's getting 
Dragon Queen might be good here. And just get some lackeys. Generating some sort of board again. Notice how he's done that every turn, apart from the the Galakon turn where he had to. He's a lot more reticent than me to use the flick. I was going to say I wonder if he's saving it for something, but he has now finally used. It. I just want the four four on the board. Like the removal spell is great, obviously, but just getting a four four on the board is a big deal. Well, Chenming still has this uh, Dragon Queen Alex Strahd in his hand and he's still not dead. So the jury still out on whether he could have used that earlier. But starting to look like that was a good decision. <laughs> Just want to see Maligos backstab. I don't think I'm going to though. And evolving your shield of Galakond into a six drop after drawing some lackeys doesn't seem like the worst thing ever either. We might just see this Cobalt Point face as well. Two evolve opportunities to get something fruity here. Stick or twist, four seven. Yeah. Not quite sure what to do, and I'm not quite sure what to do either. In general, the even number casting costs are better than the odd number ones. At least at the moment, that's not necessarily something that will continue throughout all of Hearthstone. But currently, that's the rule of thumb to decide whether, you know, if you like your six drop, then it's probably not worth going for a seven. That's just the approximation super close to lethal obviously now but you always are he's been super close to lethal since about turn five when I was saying about how not getting to twisting nether could be a big deal well twisting nether's still in hand Jamming's still alive he's got Dragon Queen Alex Stars and Zephyrus ready to go with only five cards left which is super unlucky this deck can have those active with like 19 cards left. And because I won't want to take another point of damage. I won't want to take another two. 24 is a big deal. I'd like to see him try and set up lethal here and remove the board. You know what does that? Maligos does that. He's looking for damage in the form of lackeys. I, I can understand this. Right, there it is. He can put his opponent to 10. This says you've got to heal. But... Puts him down to 21 himself. There is nothing like lethal available though for Tian Ming. So he's going to need to heal. Otherwise he's just dead to Kronks, Shadow Set Kronks. Well, there's a bit of spell damage but it's nowhere near enough. Is there anything Tian Ming can do here? And again, the Dragon Queen Alex Straza questions kind of never going to be fairly answered because three cards left, really? Hmm. <laughs> One off. But Sees the route that I didn't see with the double buff. Because the buffs are doing six damage, not five. And when you're one off, doing one extra damage twice is easily enough. Omega Zero holding on there for a long time to that 
didn't ever play the Malagos, which to me is a sign that maybe he shouldn't have taken it, but the game may have developed differently. He may have got a spell that did damage from a different lackey. Um, but he does get it done. He goes 2-1 ahead. And now it's time for Rogue versus Demon Hunter. A matchup that, as I always say, I think, let's call it around 50-50. Um, but you wouldn't expect it, right? Because Rogue can't heal. However, what happens, and Omegazira has the absolute nuts here for this matchup, is it turns out that Spy Mistress just cuts down the Demon Hunter's tempo gain. Uh, Demon Hunter, the absolute master of tempo with its zero mana spells, its hero power costing one, card draw that costs nothing, eye beams and such like. And the way to cut that tempo down is to kill off their things with a one drop. As it happens, he has drawn absolutely horrifically here. This is like such a rare Demon Hunter hand, but when you get this hand, you lose. Maybe you don't, but look at the difference. Jemming needs to force that damage in, otherwise Rogue gets the board and doesn't let go it. Puts all the nonsense down, and Omega Zero has the luxury of not even having to play the Spy Mistress here on turn two. And when you get into that position, you are going incredibly well. Yeah, just go wide. Like, Demon Hunter, when you know the deck list at least, can't deal with wider boards, usually. And so it makes perfect sense to do it this way. This is more for the mirror. Changing the hero power cost than it is for anything else. Really, really good in the mirror. The Blowtorch Saboteur. Because it triples the cost of the hero power. So we were seeing this played mainly for the mirror. That's partly why the warrior is banned, I should imagine. I was at the start saying that I thought that it was interesting that he brought the, the Dragon Druid and then still banned the warrior. But this will be why he's teched for the mirror match. But he's not teched for drawing absolutely horribly like this. He has to play Kane and kill something. He could play the weapon and just wipe out the board with the coin. Altruist is clogging up his hand right now. This is absolutely horrific. Don't see how he gets out of this. He's still on 27, I'm saying I don't see how he gets out of it, but I can see the two hands. So, he does have a lot of explosive damage here, which is really quite rare. He's got the meta, which is 10 damage. Um, Warglaives could be another 12. Altruist can be a few more. I mean, he's got the damage available. But how does he not die? I'm also not keen, by the way, on the fact he threw this on the board and then didn't know what to attack. Uh, this was a complicated turn. If he hadn't made his decision, that should have stayed in his hand. Because playing the Warglaves was definitely another valid option there. I think he was right not to. I think he's done the right thing. So, the way he did this took the damage off the board, but also didn't give Omega Zero his free card. Omega Zero is going to have to remove another damage from the board if he wants it. So, Chenming... Quite a sneaky little trick there to get two minions off the board for the price of one. But is it going to matter as Omega Zero is just rattling through his deck drawing things? Now we're going to see the Spy Mistress. Remember, like you you have to do something. Chiaming didn't make a mistake setting this up. If you play around Spy Mistress forever, you play no cards and your opponent hits you with all his other cards. So... 
Chiaming did get Omega Zero to have to unveil the spy mistress here. But you know, job done. He can move on. Not that he's got a hand to move on with. Curious to see how many charges of this weapon he puts into opposing minions here. Definitely got to do some. And we can see Omega Zero's got an insane double questing turn coming up very, very soon, or at least single questing a lot of zero mana spells. And there will be no solution for Tian Ming. Uh, the real solution usually is to play the Shadow Mistress to freeze those up and kill your opponent whilst the questings are frozen. But Tian Ming has nothing to kill an opponent with right now. Really, you really don't want to put those charges into one ones. That being said, I, I think that Tian Ming holding there, I think maybe put a charge into the face. I feel like his victory comes from some sort of metamorphosis here for ten. And you work it out by saying, okay, you're watching this game, you can see that Rogue's gonna win. It's fairly obvious to all of us that Rogue is going to win this game. But what you have to do is imagine that somebody told you that the rogue didn't win and the demon hunter won. And then go through your mind, how did that happen? How did the demon hunter win that game? And if that's how you work out how to win from a losing situation. And for me, in the situation where the demon hunter wins, Metamorphosis does 10 damage and it does it soon. And so for me, I just swung face with one weapon charge there. Even though I can see why you wouldn't, don't get me wrong, it it does make some sense to my adult old brain to hold back the charges, but I just don't think he's got the time. And then you have other weapons in your deck, and there's not much time in the game. So getting through charges isn't necessarily a disaster. That all being said... This is going to connect face for a lot more now. I genuinely don't know what to hit here. Obviously one thing has to go into face. I'm wondering if you just have to try and do some sort of racing here. So there's a lot of counting when you play Demon Hunter. Which sounds easy, but you've got to count the right things. You've got to count damage, but you've got to count damage with lots of effects thrown in. Yep. Time is now. But here come the questings. He's seen the Shadow Weaver, he's good to go. You can't freeze both of these. Oh, this is just painful stuff. Did that attack? Oh, he's buffed it. I thought he missed a damage for a second there. But the flurry of cards. And good rogue players do this. It always amazes me how quickly they can play when they know what they're trying to do. Clear the board. This is what Demon Hunter usually does to the rogue. Or not to the rogue, but to other classes. Clear the board and put down two unstoppable forces. And yeah, Tian Ming is like, looks at the, shakes his head. Ah, uh, what am I doing now? Well, I've got an eye beam. Maybe that will save me. But everything was wrong this game. The altruist clogged up the skull. Lots of things didn't go Tian Ming's way. And Omega Zero did hold back the questings for one push, which fought off. Yeah, he's had enough. Omega Zero. Picks up the win for LP. A win for the old timers over the new guys.